Hey guys, and welcome to the 100th episode of the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report, the first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. I'm Joe Baia, and I want to use this 100th episode to say, number one, thank you to all you guys that listen. You're really the reason that that we're able to make this show happen and, and have been able to have 100 episodes. Big thank you to all of our sponsors. They're the ones that keep this thing coming to you guys for free every single week. And we certainly appreciate you supporting these local businesses with your dollars. They tell us that they hear from you guys. And it means a lot to us to know that you take your dollars and, and support businesses that support the outdoors and a way of life that we like to live. And, and we hope you guys will continue to do that. Any chance you get, support these local businesses. And also a big thank you to all of our contributors, the guides and the captains and um, all of the folks that share their hard-earned knowledge with us are the real reason we're all listening. We've learned so much and continue to learn so much every week from these guys that, that give their information for free. And they don't receive anything in return other than just being a part of the fishing community and, and sharing what they've learned and, you know, that somebody shared with them at some point. And uh, big thank you to those guys as well. And we're going to start it out with one of those guys. One of my favorite tips from Angelo DiPaola. Uh, and that's going to be the focus of today's show. We're going to be doing all offshore on this rainy day as we get ready for the spring season to come about and get back out there and uh, get back out on the Gulf of Mexico and do what we love to do. So y'all enjoy this great tip from Angelo DiPaola and the 100th episode of the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report. What you got for a tip this week, Angelo? My pro tip for the day is this. When you're chunking, your weight with your hook in it is going to sink a little bit faster than your than your normal chunk baits. If you bring a couple of styrofoam coffee cups, you can pick them up at Circle K or any gas station that you swing by before you leave and put a little piece of styrofoam in your bait. It'll cause your, your hook bait to sink at the same rate as everything else. And it'll guarantee you, it'll increase your bite ratio. Dang, that's a that's one of those secrets that people don't tell that often. It really is. That's a pretty good one there. I like that, Angelo. All right, man. Well, thanks you for that report today. And uh, thanks for that tip. That was really cool. We'll, uh, we'll be talking to you again soon. All right. Good deal, guys. Y'all have a good one. Well, Skipper, every week I'm going to try to extract some more knowledge out of you. Uh, we may be, you, you know, you may be running short on that, but <laughs> run out soon. But we'll we'll right. see what it we won't can, take long. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Uh, so, Skipper, you were talking about these amberjack. Now you're talking about jigging for them. Tell tell the folks how to really jig for amberjack. I mean, what's what's the secret for that? Man, the secret for amberjack jigging. If you don't look stupid jigging for amberjack, you're not doing it fast enough. <laughs> That's Most the truth. of the time. Well, Butch doesn't have to try hard to do that. That's the hardest thing we do. That's why I'm really good at catching amberjack. <laughs> I mean, right. is, I mean, but I'm listening to you. I mean, can you jig too fast? I mean, is there? No, is, is not. It's just not the more possible. erratic, the faster, the better. You're not gonna yep. get it out in front of them. I just think that fast, fast uh, jig going by is what gets the strike, you know, it's yeah. like, a, it's just a reaction well, thing with them. What, uh, what color jigs have y'all been using this week? <sighs> We've been using several different colors. We use a chartreuse or just a white or a motor oil tail. Just kind of mix it just up. Something huh? Four ounces or so as light as you can get away with, just depending on the current and the depth, really. So naturally the lighter it is, the more action you get. All right. Well, <laughs> you heard it here, guys. You need to look stupid jigging for amberjacks <laughs> if you right. want to make it work. So that's the uh, tip of the week for the offshore skipper man thanks so much and right, uh, we'll talk to you soon be safe out there appreciate it all right skipper appreciate it bud well, that's a great report chris you know we got to get that offshore tip from you this week's offshore tip is brought to us by hilton's offshore charts the days of heading out blindly looking for good fish areas are pretty much over with don't waste your time and money on fuel searching for fish you need the most highest resolution images to not only know where to go where not to go that kind of leads us into our tip man you guys make sure you check them into check them out at hiltonsoffshore.com 
What you think for a tip this week, Chris? Well, it's kind of funny, you know, when I called in, you know, I didn't know that Hilton's was the sponsor for today's tip, but that's actually what my tip is more or less leaning towards. You know, winter time. I mean, what do we know about migratory fish? Uh, water temperature and and conditions are everything. Yep. And I think as fishermen, we're all really well versed in that saying. You should have been here yesterday. Oh yeah. Um, something I always tell people, you know, customers of mine, buddies of mine, you know, is, is make your own report. If you're waiting for the fishing report, you're getting there a day late. And one of the problems with pelagic fishing this time of year, offshore fishing, is if you can't see what the water conditions are like, you're going out there completely blind. It doesn't matter that your cousin Bobby caught tuna at Ram Pal yesterday. Those currents and those favorable conditions could have shifted 20 miles in a, you know, 30-hour period. So, you know, the, my tip is, you know, is basically what I get asked in the shop all the time is, you know, can I bring up a satellite image or whatever? It really pays if you're going to be spending the money on gas, the boat, everything else you go offshore. You need to pay that small amount, get a subscription, you know, the Hilton's uh, real-time navigator. It's, it's absolutely worth the money. It'll save you a lot of time and gas, a lot of that. You know, there'll be a learning curve to it. You can actually call or message Tom Hilton. He will gladly go over every aspect of his page. He is a wealth of knowledge and he'll cut your learning curve in half with, you know, as far as reading, you know, those satellite images, but it's worth its weight in gold to do that. If you're going to, if you're going to be an offshore fisherman, there's, there's, uh, there's no way around it. There's no way I would ever go without it ever again. That's a good tip and a uh, great plug for, for him. That's right. For sure. uh, yeah, I'm sure Tom, yeah. I'm sure Tom will be happy with that, but I mean, that's, that's the truth. You know, it's it, this time of year, it's more critical than ever because, you know, summertime, we have a lot of dirty water, of course, but temperatures, you, you know, the, you, you know how it is, especially May and June. May and June, you have a feeling that there's a lot of favorable water out there. This time of year, it's either completely right for the type of fishing you're trying to do or, exa- you know, completely wrong. We have all this cold water right now, you know, coming out of Mobile Bay and out of Mississippi River. You could hit a rip out there where the water temp on one, you know, one side's 58 and it's 72 on the other. So, you know, you've, you've got to know where those current breaks are. And um, it, it's just, it's such a small investment to, to get a subscription. It is, man. Like you say, <clears throat> this time of year, the, the guys going out there are few and far between. And like you say, whenever they get back, I mean, that could be a two or three day old report and things change so quickly out there. Exactly. Yep. That's Good a great stuff. tip, man. Appreciate you being on, Chris. Thanks, uh, thanks lot, for Chris. having me, guys. Yes, sir. Talk soon. But uh, let's get to that hate cap question. Quinn Harrelson said, I noticed Angelo talked about water temperature change and that clued him in to starting his trolling. How much of a change in water temperature does it take to say, okay, guys, this is the place. Let's get some baits out. What do you think, Angelo? I think that depends on a lot on, of what you're catching. If you've been fishing all day, you ain't got any bites, and you all of a sudden come across a 0.3 degree temperature change, like to me... Like, I've been fishing in a desert all day. I'm going to start boxing that area to to um, kind of see what's going on. Uh, and that's, that's a short answer. I mean, you know, obviously you'd like to see a one to three degree temperature break, but I can't tell you how many times we come up on a half a degree temperature break. And it's what you find is there's two, there's something going on there. There's two bodies of water meeting in that area. And so whenever that happens, there's an opportunity for the food chain to be kicking off. I mean, sometimes you see a temperature rise where you where you may have a little piece of the loop current pushing in. And and that's it could be that's tenderly a little bit bluer water, but not always. And that could be pushing up against in our area. You tend to get a little bit more when the water's all greener, it's a little bit more nutrient rich. So there should be a collision of two waters kicking off the food the food chain. And then sometimes what happens is you have an updwelling. And a lot of times when you have that, you'll see sometimes a couple of degree temperature change, uh, downward change. And that can typically that is that's what you're looking for. That's you're going to get some good bites. And what tends to ha- and sometimes this happens. If you're fishing and, and you see and you notice that, a lot of times you'll see swordfish sunning on the surface when that happens. Hmm. So, Interesting. cool fact. Yeah, uh, that's very sometimes cool. they'll bite, sometimes they won't. I've never gotten one to bite. So, 
Yeah, I've seen that one time. It's definitely something to see, and we did not get it to bite either, Angelo. It's about a 150-pound swordfish, though, so it uh, it got us fired up with a lot of hollering. We did good at hollering at it. If, that, if there was like a uh, – We do a lot of that, too. Yeah, if there was like a prize for hollering at a swordfish, we, we won it. So uh, Hollering and pushing your buddies out of the way. Right, and then pointing fingers after it's all over with, like, why didn't you go get the bait yeah. faster? Yeah. Very cool. Oh, I oh, can good, so good question. all of that. Yeah. Good question, Quinn. Quinn submitted that question over at the uh, Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report Facebook page. Y'all can definitely get in on the Hey Cap questions over there, or you can email them to us at alabama at com. And if we choose your question, we'll be sending you a fish bites prize pack maybe a t-shirt man we get all kind of stuff we'll uh we'll definitely hook you up so we appreciate those angelo you got any uh got any new hot real estate boating properties this week oh dude let me tell you we have been so busy this this is the time of year that that people like to come to the beach the weather's nice it's not crowded and and buyers and sellers are really kind of i say connecting this time of year so we we have everything from we just listed a little unit at Wolf Bay Villas. It's right there on Wolf Bay, kind of the kind of right at the T of 161 and Canal Road. Completely remodeled, granite countertops, wood plank, uh, ceramic tile. Great looking unit. Uh, two bedroom, two bath. Uh, two hundred four thousand five hundred. That is a really good deal. If you're you know if you're like, hey, I'd really love a place at the beach, place I could keep my boat. That's going to fit the bill. Uh, we got a place at the Grander, which is Grander is one of the few places that offers covered boat slips. It's three bedroom, three and a half bath with an elevator, two car garage, and a sixty foot covered boat slip. We're at uh, I think five forty nine on that. And uh, let's see what else? Oh, awesome listing over at King's Landing in Lillian, big lot. Uh, community pier with deeded boat slips, big views, two ninety nine, get you that, and we'll be bringing a awesome listing right on the point on Jubilee Point, right near Orange Beach Marina, facing the pass, just over four thousand square foot. Now, if you'll keep track on my Facebook page, probably next week we'll take that live, and we're going to be at two point one million on that. So we've got everything from houses to condos from lower end price points to upper end price points if you're looking to buy or sell in orange beach gulf shores perdido key uh get at me through uh my facebook page and uh or just call me 850-287-3440 angelo what are you seeing out of interest rates right now seems like it's a what i'd call a neutral market you know it's a good time for buyers and sellers and that sounds salesy but it's not i mean i don't mean it to sound that way it's um Interest rates are historically low. What are are you seeing right now? Interest rates are really low right now. So even though we've seen a slight increase in price, the offer for most people that are buying, that are in the buyer's market, it's almost too good to resist. I mean, I just literally had lunch with with mortgage broker I like to use uh, last or this week with a client. And he was saying that a lot of people that bought last year are actually refinancing this year because the savings are are there. So, you know, I know Quinn Harrelson is a mortgage broker out of Montgomery, Joey Parker down in Gulf Shores. He did, he's who does all my stuff. He does a great job. Uh, so yeah, I mean, get at somebody, you know, that you feel comfortable with, especially if you, you know, if you bought something the past couple of years, chances are you can save some money on the refi. And if you're looking to buy, it's a really good time. You're probably not going to find a lower interest rate in quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Good time for both sides. So, all right, buddy. Well, good to hear from you. And, and sounds like a good report. I hope you get out there and get after them. We'll uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Good deal. Holla at y'all later. All right. See you, Angelo. Keep whacking. All right. See ya. Bye. So we're going to go to our offshore report. We got Kyle Smith with Skin Deep Sport Fishing. How you doing today, buddy? 
I'm good. I'm going to give you the hay cap question this week. This okay. week's hay cap question is brought to us by Foster Contracting. The recent thunderstorms and winds have been producing wind and hail in the area and may have damaged your home's roof. The certified roofing pros at Foster Contracting offer free roof inspections, and if your roof has received damage, most homeowners will have little or no cost out of pocket when going through your insurance. If you're looking for a quality construction with a dependable, licensed, and certified fortified roofing professional, give the fortified roofing pros a call at 251-973-9999. They're a family-owned business that is big enough to get the job done, but small enough to care. Remember to support the local businesses that make your local podcast possible, and check them out at fortifiedroofingpros.com. Man, great people over there at Foster's. Good, good people, man. Oh, yeah. Big, big fan, big fan of Chad and Corinda and everyone that works for them as well. Very nice people. All right. Josh Kane is going to get the uh, Slick Lure goodies this week. Ooh. I know. That's an exciting time of year for some Slick Lure yep. goodies. Better not let me get my hands near them. Josh emailed us at Alabama at bestfishingreport.com to get his question in. And Josh asks, I've been wanting to target a marlin for a while now but I don't want to kill one by neglect or not knowing exactly how to release it alive and healthy. After hearing last week's report, it makes me want to try even more. Do you clip the leader and leave the hook when it's that close to the boat, or do you try and get it boat side and remove the hook? So what is your best advice on releasing a healthy blue marlin, Kyle, I would say? Yeah, that's going to be a great question and answer. I can't wait. Yeah, I mean, I think if you have one that's, you know, lit up real well and healthy, I mean, you're the big, the biggest thing you want to do is keep the boat in gear, you know, and you don't want to over drown them either. You don't want to get too much water going. You don't want to be going too fast, but you don't want to be going too slow. But if you got a good, healthy one and the fish is acting right, lit up, and you can get the hook out of its mouth without stressing the fish out, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot, you know, a lot of times when we release fish, we try to get on them pretty quick and and we'll pop the leader on them when they're acting real green still. Mm-hmm. Just because we don't want to put a lot of stress on the fish. And I think a lot of those circle hooks rust out, don't you? Yes, sir. 100%. 100%. I mean, they do. And like I said, if you can get on them quick, and, and you know, especially when we're out fishing tournaments, we don't want to stress the fish out. Because sure. we, don't, we don't want to kill them. We don't, we don't have a need to. So. So I think there's a lot of factors that come into play here. We were talking a little bit earlier. I think a lot of it depends on, like you're talking about the fish and the health the fish is in, how long you fight the fish, and the boat that you're on. I mean, the boat That's that you're right. on makes makes a world of difference on you know the strategy on releasing that healthy fish. That's right. Like how, how your gunnel height and stuff like That's that, right. how your ability to get your hands down to the water, obviously, is going to be a big factor in that. I mean, you fished on the Escape some. It's very interesting yep. to uh, de-hook a marlin on the side of the mm-hmm. escape. You know, it's six foot tall. Oh, at least six foot. Yeah. And well, I mean, yeah. But then you got to go over the gunnel. I mean, yeah. I've I've got pictures and video of me holding Joe. He's six foot six by the ankles, and he's over the side of the boat grabbing, oh, oh, oh. grabbing him by the bill. You know. Yeah. We've tried snoozers. That's, that's and pretty intense, right there. It is, man. Uh, some trust, some friendship trust, some right trust. there for sure. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it's interesting you say uh, about keeping the boat in gear. I think that's probably where a lot of people probably mess up on a billfish. Or really, uh, really that matter for try, trying to take a lot of like, especially when you're talking about bigger, you know, pelagics, you mm-hmm. know, stuff like that. Keeping the boat in gear, I think, is real important, you know, because you can get the fish pointed in a direction and you can kind of work on him work on him with the with the rod quite a bit nice and slow and smooth right up to the boat keep him you know try not to pull their head up out of the water keep them down just below the water and then make a move on it and uh get control of it and either pop the hook out or 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 use your uh use your uh your cutter tool or uh, you say pop them off i don't know if you guys use a little tool to cut the line or whatnot we'll usually just hold on to the leader and uh okay we do a lot of snelling and a snell is a, you know, that's a knot that's made to break right there at the eye of the hook. Okay. So if you hold on to that leader real hard and just let them swim off and they'll pull away from them a little bit and pop them right off. Right. Because we're, yeah. we're not using, you know, real heavy leaders either, you know, anywhere from 200, 180 to 200 pound tests. So. Right. Yeah. And you said something uh, before before we came on about you catch fish with hooks in them all the time. I do that as well. You know, you catch uh, red uh, redfish are notorious and and of course uh, a few speckled trout here or there but i catch great healthy fish all the time that have hooks in them already you know and mm-hmm. uh most of the time you get lucky if you can get a hold of them you can uh, you can get that hook out and release them with uh with less tackle than they had in them when you caught them so a little less bling that's right that's right it doesn't affect them uh i mean those hooks don't take long to rust out i mean they really don't that's right so josh i hope we answered your question man um sounds like we need to look 
to give you a more exact question, I would want to know what kind of boat you're fishing from, honestly. Yeah. Just because I've done both. I've done, you know, fishing on the Vikings and the, I mean, the Lady Anne, that 57 Gilman is, is mm-hmm. a cakewalk, releasing one compared to the Escape, so. Right. Or, yeah, or even that matter, like uh, fishing a boat without boards, you know, mm-hmm. I'm sure it's kind of a, it's got to be a completely different deal as well. Sure. I would think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because you, you don't have quite as much maneuverability out of an, a boat without boards as you do in boards. But, uh, you know, some, sometimes the gunnel height's a little Just higher on some of those boats as well so you kind of got to kind of think think through those things a little bit I mean, that's a great answer though kyle man appreciate you uh appreciate no you problem, coming man. on the no show problem. appreciate you coming on the show and telling us giving us some of your knowledge that's some really really priceless stuff for some guys who've never gone out and done done that i don't know if it's knowledge or luck and probably a lot of luck <laughs> hey well you awesome. know i always say i'd rather be lucky than good Absolutely. all day long and twice Absolutely. on sunday beat me to it yep that's yeah. what i was gonna say too well man. kyle we appreciate it man keep whacking them we'll talk to you soon yes sir man what a great offshore report that's some really really exciting i know man i'm excited to have uh captain chris veche on i know he does all kind of stuff all right, Chris, can, you know we can't let you get out of here without that tip. This week's <laughs> offshore tip is brought to us by Killer Dock. As anglers, we put a lot of time, money, and passion into our fishing, but most of us don't have a fish cleaning station that we're proud of. Man, I was talking to Jay before the show, actually, and they're doing some really cool stuff. He was telling me about um, there's a big, giant Viking building a big boathouse over in Orange Beach, and they're putting one of those eight-foot stretches mm. in a 10-foot canopy oh my goodness. under that boathouse or on the dock on that boathouse. I'm pretty excited to see we're that. We're going to have a party under that thing, I'm huh? ready, I like the party. <laughs> I'm pretty excited to see the end result of that, man. These guys, there's nothing these guys can't do, man. Killer Dock, they use marine-grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. You guys go check them out at KillerDock.com or on Facebook at their Killer Dock site. You know what I can't believe about mine is how clean it stays. All they the coat, time. They coat the metal. They coat everything so it just stays nice and clean, easy to spray off at the end of, the, uh, at the end of cleaning your yep. fish and whatnot. Keeps you nice and cool, especially right now. I know you like your clean feet. Uh, oh, my goodness gracious. You know. <laughs> you know. What you think for a tip there, Chris? I think I'm going to reiterate kind of what I was touching on there with the bottom fishing because it, you know, we were talking about I mentioned bait, having the right bait. And mm-hmm. it's not just it's not just the bottom fish, and it's also the inshore right now. You know, I, I mentioned having cigar minnows, sardines, hardtails, you know, better quality baits offshore. And, you know, that's something I'm going to get. It always draws the additional questions. Okay, where do I catch those? How do I catch those? And usually for for sardines, for cigar minnows, you know, speaky rigs, usually number six, number eight. I like the ones with – you know, the little glow bead on the head of them, but yep. I'm going to target structures in anywhere from 30 to say 60 feet of water usually for those. Now structures could be a lot of different things. There are plenty of public structures, uh, you know, that are published, you know, on outdooralabama.com, um, you know, many places and on a lot of charts you can, you can purchase for most tackle shops, any, any public structure in that, that depth range will hold clouds of boat as we come into the fall. And it's just a matter of taking the time to get out, you know, position over those structures and drop those sabiki rigs. For hardtails, for um, uh, ruby lips, like I mentioned, you know, you got to go a little bit bigger. I'll usually use a two or three hook rig for ruby lips, small circle hooks, like a, you know, number two or even a number four tip with a really small piece of squid. That's going to do better on the ruby lips. And the main, probably the main tip I can say about catching those and more or less keeping them alive is when you hook up to those, you need to reel them up slowly. They're no different than a snapper or a grouper. If you bring them up too fast, they will suffer from barotrauma and, you know, get the buggy eyes and, mm-hmm. and your live bait becomes a dead bait. For inshore, you know, on the same lines, having the right bait. If you go and you buy live shrimp right now, live shrimp will catch, obviously, everything. But our inshore waters are so heavily plagued <laughs> this time of year with pinfish that live shrimp doesn't usually go real far. The guys that do, um, that have more consistent and successful inshore trips, know you've got to take the time, throw the net, you know, try to get finger mullet, try to get smaller, um, you know, LYs, pilchards, whatever you want to call them. Mm-hmm. But uh, croakers and finger mullet in particular will usually yield a lot better quality inshore fish. That's awesome, man. That's and I, would, I would say that that's, that's probably, the, you know, inshore or offshore, it's taking the time to get better quality bait. It's it's real easy to go buy frozen bait. It's real easy to go buy live bait. 
but that's usually not you know, a lot of time that's not what the, the better quality fish are feeding on yep i agree with that it's not where it's at i think captain richard can uh, test to that as that's well. right yep uh man if it was easy everybody would be doing it right that's a fight yep. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> like separates said, the men from the boys yep, that's like like you said you know uh, it's really easy to go buy frozen bait and you know some days you'll get lucky and that'll work real good, but uh, the guys who really know what they're doing, you'll Consistently, see. Consistently, yep. that I know uh, doing what I do, for, you know, doing what I do day in, day out, hard work yields much more. Greater than, reward. Yeah, for sure. greater reward. That's right. You yeah, know, there's some, no doubt about that. That's right. In a lot of days, I spend, uh, I work just as hard at catching the bait as I do either catching fish or not catching fish. Yep. You know what I mean? Because it's worth but, it and it's, yeah, it's you, necessary. Yep. And then taking the precaution to keep it, keep it alive in your live well all day long, too. That's a another science we could sit here and talk about for hours <laughs> hours, yeah. hours with too, oh, yeah. you know making bait is uh is definitely it's part of it you know what i mean it for gets sure. to where um uh, you, you know how it goes with some of these billfish guys man like when they're live baiting these marlins and stuff it's like sometimes it's the guys who know how to catch the black fins right. you know what i mean it's not yeah it's not necessarily about catching the marlin it's about being able to catch the no, bait quality, to catch the marlin. quality bait and you know how you yeah. you know with that and that with all how you catch the bait did you catch it on a lure treble hooks or a j hook did the fish hit the deck when you run hooking yep. it you know it's, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be top quality otherwise it gets you know it gets thrown right back in yeah but it's all, all about those little fine details that that they'll kind of yep. set you apart from everybody else you're exactly right well, chris yeah. it was great talking to you man as usual and uh that was a great report and thanks for the tip and thanks for uh thanks for your time yep thanks for yes, being on chris we'll talk to you soon thanks for having me guys yes sir thanks I saw a giant tuna caught this week. Let's go over and talk to Angelo Di Paola and see what the story is in Blue Water. Angelo, man, what's happening in Blue Water? It sounds like we got uh, got things heating up, so to speak. Well, you know, it's the beginning of February. To me, this is like prom lump season off of off the mouth of the river. And it's going on right now. I mean, uh, Eddie Berger just caught one, uh, 224. Bill Staff on the Sea Spray out of Orange Beach who moves his boat over to Fushon, caught a 207. I know there's another fish in the 200-pound the range caught. So really what we're talking about this year, if you're fishing our part of the world and you want to get in on big fish, is lump fishing and fishing the short rigs off of Louisiana. And when we talk about the lump, you have the midnight lump and you have the salt dome, the horse, what we call the horseshoe lump, which is – goes from about 400 to 200 if you just run over to where the horseshoe rigs used to be there's still some out there but not as many as there used to be you'll see a, it'll look kind of like a parking lot on a calm day you'll know you're there when you get there i mean if and, you guys uh, see your console it's nowhere to trailer over there just launch out of what's the best place to launch out of i've never burnt, done it i've never I, done it for big boats well, it, I, you know personally if, if we're leaving from our part of the world dolphin island orange beach fort morgan I mean, out of Dawson Island, it's 91 miles. So to me, I just assume run from our home port True. And, and go over there. It's just a quicker run. I mean, you can put, if you're going to be over there for three, four days, you can just put your boat on the trailer, go and, and trailer it on down to uh, Venice Marina or Sportsman's over there. Uh, I think Port Eads is closed right now. So I don't think you're going to have that option. Mm-hmm. But, you know, or you could just run your boat over there fish the day and then run up spend the night in the hotel and then fish your way back the next day which we've done that before too well, it's pretty easy what's you want to get an early start if you're going to leave from this part of the world you know three thirty, four o'clock in the morning kind of start and get you over there by daybreak uh, and right. it's easy it's not hard fishing you know you want to bring a plenty of pogies men hating whatever you want to call them so you can start getting your chum line going and I know a lot of people will say, don't put a lot of chum in the water. I tend to think the exact opposite. I think the boat that gets the most chum in the water the quickest is more likely to get more fish behind your boat. So okay. we'll get going and we won't even put lines in for, for the first 10 minutes of it until we start seeing bonitas and stuff show up in the chum slick. And so what you're going to have is, have is you're probably going to get small sharks a lot of, lots of king mackerel. So make sure you bring a lot of hooks. And for me, if it's muddy, then I want to fish heavier leader. You know, if I can get away with 130, 100 pound test fluorocarbon, I will. And now you need, I like a number five 
circle hook. And, and even a big fish can get hooked by that little bitty hook. Mm-hmm, for sure. Angelo, yeah. what about the wahoo bite? Has it still been strong over there? Wahoo bite's been strong. And here's the thing about wahoo fishing over there. And it's just like the tuna, tuna fishing. Sometimes it's going to be really good, and sometimes it's not. You know, it's a little bit of a hit and miss fishery. And just everybody over there trolls stretch 30s. But we've caught them fishing, fishing hardtails just like you would for king mackerel on a downrigger. Heck, we've caught them on live Benitas before. And you can catch them on the lump, or you can catch them fishing those rigs either way. And you don't need to be in clear water. And quite often, five, ten feet below that muddy water, and it's real nice blue water. And they're there. I like that, Angelo. All right, man. We'll, uh, we'll be talking to you again soon. All right. Good deal, guys. Y'all have a good one. Man, it's good to hear that blue water's cranking up. I, I get excited hearing about the lumps over there. Not so excited. You got to take some lumps when you're fishing on the lumps, but man, it can, be, it can be good. It can be really good over there for sure. And you got a chance at a once in a lifetime fish over there. So it makes me want some sashimi. Man, I am excited about this next interview, Joe. Me too. Can't Let's wait get to right. Let's get right to it. So last week, as far as we know, the Gulf record yellowfin was caught. How much did it weigh, Butch? I think it was 258. 258 pounds. I mean, that's just wild. It's gigantic. Let's get the story. Let's talk to Van Yath and his son Nick Yath caught the big tuna, right? Right, Van? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you guys were out of Venice? Yes, uh, we, we uh, left out of Venice. Voodoo fishing charters hooked you guys up. It sounds like. Oh yeah, they were fantastic. Uh, it was our first time out uh, Venice and also outside tuna fishing, and I uh, mean we we kind of hit the the lottery with them. So your first tuna fishing trip, and you're pretty much retired. I mean, how can you beat that? Your son, especially. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's correct. Well, you know, he, he said, uh, "Well, next time we'll, we'll go for the Wahoo record." Uh-huh. I like that. <laughs> so your son, your son actually caught the fish. And how old is he? He's 14. Whew, man. That is awesome. That is so awesome. So, I mean, he basically won the Super Bowl. Pretty his much. First, his first time At out. At 14 years old. Let's, oh, hear yeah. about, let's hear about how you guys caught this fish. So you leave out of Venice. Uh, what type of boat is Voodoo uh, Fishing Charters? What type of boat were you, was he running? Uh, we were on a nice boat. It was a 42-foot yellowfin with uh quads on the back um that thing just it we were wide open all day and just in you know five to six foot seas we were still pushing 50 it was no problem it was awesome wow wow it's amazing it's amazing what where boats have gotten to and what you're able to do so you guys go out and uh was this like the first fish of the day was it right off the bat uh y'all been fishing for a long time no so you know the first thing we did was um we went and got um some bait a couple of shrimp boats. The third one we went to, um, they had bait. So, you know, our first mate actually jumped off our boat onto their boat, got got the bait, threw it back on our boat, and um, went to a buoy and got some uh, some live bait just to have. So really, you know, the first hour we're getting bait. One of the first shrimp boats we went to, actually the first shrimp boat we went to that didn't have any bait, he, uh, we saw that he had a nice school of whatever underneath his boat. So as soon as we got uh, bait, we... Uh, went after that first room I went to and we just started uh jumping behind them and uh we were actually able to hook one probably similar to the size that we caught I me mean, and it was almost a 200 pounder that that just blew the reel up just destroyed it got off within 10 minutes after that we caught we caught a nice size one it's probably 150 pound yellow fin which actually was the the second biggest fish of the week down there uh when we got to um the marina, everybody was, was uh, ooh and eyeing over the first fish until they saw the second fish. <laughs> I'm sure. 150-pound <laughs> yellowfin is nothing to sneeze it's at. It's a anywhere. big yellowfin, yeah. So you catch this 150, and you guys are high five and thinking, great day already, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. When we, when we caught it, I mean, that was the biggest fish any of us have seen in person. And, uh, you know, some of my clients, uh, they were like, hey, this is a contender for um, – you know, for the biggest fish uh, you guys have caught for the year. And uh, the caps are now nah, the biggest one I've seen was 216. So, well, okay, you know, we got some work to do. But regardless, you know, we had, had you know, fish on the boat, so we were good, man. We were we were on the board, so. So what next? You know, went uh, looking for a couple other shrimp boats. I think we were 
probably about an hour or two just chasing different boats. Just uh, all we could get was sharks. Cal Bonita, uh, caught a black, nice, nice black fin. And then the captain remembered, you know, the, the, the first fish, you know, we were in blue water, so we went back out, further out. We saw some boat, you know, a ways out. Kind of blue water, you know, we were chumming again, and uh, we didn't really see any sharks. Saw one or two, like, small bonita. Uh, and, uh, but we were marking something on the, uh, the fish finder. And, you know, the rest of us, we were kind of just talking and, and relaxing. And my son was watching, you know, he's with the, the captain, and he was, he was watching the captain. He threw out a... Uh, a uh, live bait on a flat line. He saw something, you know, something taking it. And uh, to be honest, they, they both thought it was, you know, something small because the, the way the fish acted. But uh, <laughs> like as soon as the uh, captain, you know, pushed the drag lever up and the fish realized it was hooked, it just, it was game on. Yeah, that's this awesome. This thing took off. Yeah, this thing took off just like something you see on Wicked Tuna, right? I mean, just, <laughs> <laughs> it was it Wicked was Tuna. Nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was nuts. Uh, then everybody got up. By the time you know, the, the captain handed the rod to my son, I mean, the, the fish had almost spooled him, so we had to chase it with the boat. I mean, uh, Captain Matt was awesome. I mean, he was just, uh, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have gotten this fish. I mean, he, he got that boat turned and chasing this fish, and we were probably, if one of the videos that I sent, I mean, we were probably going 25, 30 miles an hour chasing this fish. Um, and, wow. uh, you know, my son, luckily my son knows what to do, you know, keep tension on the fish, and, you know, you, he, he uh, was able to get half the spool back on, and, um, Man, he fought that thing for a good 20, 20 minutes, got 90% of the spool back on the uh, the reel. And then uh, when he got to the lead, that, that's when it got challenging. So uh, the fish pretty much stayed at 150 feet. It would not come past the thermocline. You know, my son would get it up to like 140 feet and it would go down to 160. He did that for a while. He got tired, so then he handed me the, the rod. I did the same thing. I, I pulled the I fought it for good you know four or five minutes it felt like i was doing a uh, 200 pound curl for five minutes straight how bad um, <laughs> you know I, I, would, I would reel it up 10 15 feet and it'll take me back down 20 feet i mean you could see the the um the lead knot just going back and forth back and forth i got tired of getting back to nick he fought it for someone he got tired of getting back to me i got tired of gave it to jeremiah he got tired of gave it to captain <laughs> I mean, it just we could not get the fish past the 150. It, it was it was nuts, and we didn't realize how how big it was. We knew it was big. So um, how long uh, how yeah, long was the whole fight? Total. So from my video, I, I videoed as soon as it was hooked, and then when we landed, it was right at 45 minutes. Wow, that's not bad for a that's not bad at all. I've fought them. No. I mean, I've seen longer fights than that. Y'all did a good job. I've seen. I've yeah. I've seen 185 take three hours. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, say, we y'all, able, y'all did a good job on a fish that size. Yeah, yeah, we were able to muster up. I mean, like I said, my son got up to, to the um, the lead, and I think if we would have known that, that that fish that big, I mean, we would have just put the belt on him because that's that's the only reason. I think that's the only way we were able to get it up that fast. Because uh, once Jonathan, my client, got up, he's like, "Hey, I'm fresh." You know, we handed him the 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 rod, and uh, Cap says, "Get the belt out." <laughs> just yeah. sat the man, yeah. and he was he was able to keep tension on on the fish, and he was able to get the fish pass um, the thermocline. I think well, once we got him to about 120, 115 feet, he, he just pretty much just gave up and we were able to, to drag him to the surface. Y'all have a pretty, you know, did you have a pretty normal time, easy time landing him? Nothing crazy happened at the boat, did it? No, it just, it, um, once he got up, I mean, it took five of us to get him in the boat. I mean, we had three gas in him, uh, tail rope, and, and uh, you know, guys, you know, grabbed by the gills to get him into the boat. That's awesome. I mean, That's so awesome. Such a cool story <laughs> and such a cool experience for you and your son and the whole everybody Absolutely. out there for sure. What was it like coming back to Venice Marina with a 258 pound yellowfin on the deck? I bet people were were gawking. Oh, oh yeah. So the first fish was big. The second fish was, was of course, way bigger. It wouldn't fit in a fish box. <laughs> so we had it, we spent probably 35, 45 minutes out there trying to get it in the fish box. We had to take <laughs> the the first one out, put the the big one in the first one wouldn't fit in. So we had to cut the first, the, the tail off the first one to get it to fit, hmm. you know? And then, you know, we, we kind of just messed around, did some little snapper fishing here, tried to get, you know, target cobia, just, you know, just to pass time. But then, you know, we were all thinking the same thing. We need to get this uh, fish back to the marina so we could show it off. So we, we yeah. actually cut the, the trip short. I don't blame uh, you. Flew back. Yeah. <laughs> 
know, flew back to the the marina. Uh, once we we got there, man, that that's that that's when you know all the excitement, just the, the energy was 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 amazing. Um, that's awesome, man. There were there were a lot of people there, just eating, um, chilling on the uh, the patio. And, you know, people, of course, you know, walk around. And uh, when we, once we um, got there, everybody had already heard that we caught a monster. So we, we put the first fish on the bow, you know, to offload. And everybody thought that thing was huge. I mean, we had people come up, taking pictures of him. And they were really excited about the first fish. It took us almost an hour to get the the, um, the big fish out of the um, fish cooler because the, the head was so big, it was lodged in there. I mean, it, it literally took three of us pushing and pulling. I mean, almost an hour to get it out. It's a big And tenor. once we got it out, yes. That's uh that's so cool, man. I'm I'm glad you guys had that experience. That's truly a truly a once in a lifetime experience. You you hear that thrown around a lot, and but that is, I mean, you're you're almost assuredly not going to catch a tuna bigger than that in your lifetime. So that's an amazing thing, amazing thing for your son to see. Hopefully, he's not spoiled. Hopefully, all of you aren't spoiled, and you'll keep. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, keep no, at no. it. it, it <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's right. I mean, it's uh, uh you know, lifetime trip with a lifetime fish, and it's just uh. I think all you know, all seven of us on board we're we're pretty much connected moving forward, man. I mean that's just one moment in our lives that we get to share and it's just very special. I mean you remember yeah. the rest of your life. Very cool. Absolutely. Well well thank you for sharing the story with us. I, I know that's one I'm not gonna forget either. And uh we're gonna be sharing some photos that, that you've sent us over over the uh coming days on social media. That's Matt, just an amazing fish. So congratulations and congratulations to uh to Nick. Man, I hope y'all get to do it again. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, I hope so. Oh, definitely. And, and uh, just I want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Voodoo Charters, man. I don't think it would have been possible without them. I mean, Captain Matt and Voodoo, man, he was he was fantastic. I mean, he, he made sure we, we, we got fish on the boat, and boy, did he. Yeah, awesome, so, I mean, man. Yeah, y'all check out y'all customers check out Customers Charters. for life right there. Oh, he's, uh, <laughs> he's out of Venice Marina, right, Van? He, he's, he's all the time out yes, of Venice sir. Marina? Excellent. Yes, sir. Excellent. All right, Van. Well, thanks, man. Sure do appreciate you sharing that story with us. And hopefully we get to talk to you again soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. All right, man. Where are we headed to next? We got to wrap it up with an offshore report. Thank goodness it's it's improving out there. We got some great Heck reports. Yeah. We're going to have back on with us today, Crystal Hightower, also known as the science lady. But... Yeah. <laughs> Crystal, what is your official title with the University of South Alabama? Well, officially, I'm the senior research laboratory manager for the fisheries ecology lab. It's a mouthful. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Yeah, it's... it is. Yeah, you don't you don't go to school that long for just a short, you know, title like the science lady. Well, you know, we're not going to let you get out of here without an offshore tip. This week's okay. offshore tip is brought to us by CCA Alabama, another great way to support conservation projects like the Claude Petit Flounder Hatchery in the University of South Alabama Cobia Tagging Project is through the purchase of a distinctive CCA Alabama saltwater fishing license plate. Just head over to Alabama Department of Revenue's distinct license plate page at revenue.alabama.gov to get yours. What do you think for an uh, offshore tip this week, Crystal? Okay. So like I, said, you know, I was going to do the whole long title, but I figured I didn't have time in this show. Give us the science, give us the science lady off too. Yeah. You, you do have a, a, a time limit here, you know? That's right. <laughs> no. Um, no, so, I mean, for me, like, in terms of doing something new, like, you know, going out and, and kite fishing or, like, catching these big tunas, like, wahoo, whatever it is, like, just knowing, like you said, you've got like a great crew out there. There are definitely people that have the experience on me that I don't have. Like, so just being a little humble and listening to the crew, listening to your deckhands, listening to your captain, like it's so easy to get so excited about a big fish like that and just completely lose it. You know, I mean, I think really just for me, paying attention and, and trusting in your crew and captain and listening to what they have to say and do exactly what they tell you to do. And for the most part, if you do what they tell you to do and you don't horse around with it, yeah. they'll get the fish in, you know? Yep. Man, oh, yeah. it, that's a really good point. And it's something that I've been lucky enough to get to fish in some other places, you know, besides the Gulf Coast. And I, I try to act like, I don't know anything when I well, go to those places. It shouldn't be that hard for you to do. Right. I mean, it's, it comes naturally. 
but uh but no but but in 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 seriousness because i want to learn the way they do it i don't want right. to inject right. my, my way because that's how you can bring something back to your fishery yep. and you know i've picked up stuff from freshwater guys to use in salt water and vice versa i've picked up stuff from alaska and the west coast to use back here and butch we saw some some stuff out in hawaii that was unbelievable that i mean they fish completely different totally different yeah. right. totally different so it's um that's a great point is just to go out there and let heck and the other good thing is if you do it their way and you lose a fish you can blame it you can always rub it in their face that's exactly. right it's not your fault yeah it's a win it's a win-win <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, Crystal, thank you for all you do with the uh, with the with the research on all of our fish. And I'm looking really looking forward to finding out more of the of the data that you're going to get back from, especially this cobia tagging project. Mm -hmm. I'm, oh I'm, yeah. I'm partial to to the ling, but uh, thanks for being <laughs> on with us today. And glad to hear you guys are on fish. And I uh, hope you wrap up your fall and and get all your tags out. And we'll look forward to having you back on soon. Sweet. Thanks so much. Okay, report. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah, speaking of blue water, so let's go talk to Angelo Di Paola. He's got another their offshore report for us this week. Sweet. Well, Angelo, oh. we were talking we were talking off air a little uh, last week uh, about chunking, and you've given us some great tips on chunking the last couple of weeks. Maybe those guys over on the lumps didn't have any styrofoam cups with them. I don't know, but <laughs> I, I want you to, I want you to tell everybody what you were talking about 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 chunking that bait on one particular side of the boat. Do you remember what we were talking about there? Oh yeah. So, like, one of the things, especially on a bright, sunny day, you know, even if you've stretched your leader out and you, you've got a little piece of styrofoam in your chunk, but you're seeing the fish, they're just coming up and they're turning off of it right away. A lot of times what's happening is you're getting some light reflect, refraction off your leader and they're just leader shine. They're turning off. That happens when you get, like, really clear water situations. So there's a couple things you can do to counteract that. One of them is, is start trying to chunk them into the shaded side of the boat because now you don't have any sun reflecting off your leader. If the current and everything doesn't set up for that, the other thing you can do is take your wash down hose and spray it up in the air, kind of like uh, you don't want the, the blaster. You just kind of want, you know, where it's going to create a bunch of droplets and that's going to kind of camouflage your line. It's going to break up the sun on the surface of the water and it's going to make it harder for fish to see your line. You don't have to do this all the time, but every once in a while, you know, you get out there and you see the fish, you're like, we just, they just won't bite. Little trick, sometimes it saves the day. Oh, no doubt. When fishing gets hard, man, you got to be creative. <laughs> I've done some silly stuff to get some bites before. That's a fact. And, oh, yeah. And some days, one fish is all it takes to turn, That's right. turn, turn a day or even turn a trip around. So, Angelo, uh, got to get the real tip from you this week, though, on the offshore side of things. Before we do that, I want to tell you about our offshore tip sponsor for the week. It's Biloxi Boat Show, February 7th through the 9th, 2020, at the Mississippi Coast Coliseum. For more information, go to Gulf Coast Shows. Dot com. All right, Angelo, you've given us some some really good tips uh, last few weeks, and and I really like what you were just saying. But but what else you got? So this is my pro tip of the day. So we're coming into trigger fish season, and it's one per person. And you may think, all right, well we're going to knock that out real quick. Do we just go back in, or do we like spend the rest of the day fishing? If you're me, and I get to go out and go fishing. I'm spending the rest of the day fishing, and so really. I don't know about you guys, I always feel like the scamp bite really picks picks up good in the springtime. There's still lots of beeliners and stuff out there. So one of the things that I really like to do is uh, take a diamond jig or a butterfly jig or any kind of jig that you like, or uh, actually the old school amberjack jig with the twin curly tails. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes this time, of, this time of year, that really outfishes live bait. So we'll put a live bait out on the bottom, but we're a lot of times you're fishing like rocky structure that doesn't come real high up off the bottom, which I think is just better scant structure than a big giant rock or piece of um, wreck or something. And so you're just kind of drifting along where well, you can, I like to put like two, like a, like a chicken rig and put like a little hoochie squid over the top and put a little piece of squid on it and jig that with my jig up on the bottom, on the bottom of that. Cause Hey, I can pick up some uh, bee liners or even scamps on those I know some guys, and, and I really like this idea, and they were telling me about it. They like to use the electric reel because you can kind of put it on a slow 
real mow and jig it up about 20 feet in the water column and then just drop it back down. You'll just start mm-hmm. cu- you can just cover more ground that way. A lot of times this time of year, you just catch more scants on the jig than you do the live bait. And you still have that out there fishing. You just leave it in the rod holder. Rodney rod holder hooks fish better than we do most of the time anyways. Definitely. Diversification. I like it. And it does yeah, seem like you, uh, it seems like you never know uh, where they're going to come from. We've had plenty of days where the scenario that you're, you just were talking about was true. You know, we caught more on the jigs than we did on live bait. And, and like you said, too, springtime, it seems to be that that is more of the case. Not to mention the fact that it's really hard sometimes to find bait in the spring. But we, yeah. had, but hey. we have had just as many days where, and we talked about this some, you know, last summer. Uh, with Devin Potts, where you you know he basically said, "Hey, you you've got to have live cigar minnows right now. If you don't have yeah. live cigar minnows, you pretty well hang it up." So, yeah. I uh, think in the summer that the live bait plays a bigger role. Uh, but this time of year, like you guys said, it's just hard to catch it. Yep. Well, Angelo, thanks, man. Good report this week. Uh, sounds like things are, are are a little slow, but it should only pick up from here. I uh, really appreciate it. I hope you get to go out soon. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Y'all have a good one. Well, good deal, Skipper. It sounds like fishing's good. It's heating up this week. You're gonna be you're gonna be uh, answering our hey cap question. We got a good one this week. I, uh, this is this is one that's always stumped me. So, Butch, who did we pick this week? It comes from Stacy Reese, and he asks: When going offshore and dropping baits, he has been unsuccessful with catching anything but red snapper. What techniques would you suggest for better getting on some trigger fish, jacks, aggregate species? I would assume. What you think, there, Cap? I think. Um each species you go after is going to be a little different, but I think a lot of people get hung up on you're fishing on a reef, they drop down a 15 off giant hook, you know, attached, that's got a whole pogey on it or a, some kind of live bait, um, you know, that's 10 inches long. And probably all you're going to get on that is a snapper, you know? Right. Uh, I would just, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Scale, yeah, we scale back a little bit. You know, use some squid, some smaller pieces of bait, maybe the size of a half dollar for your reef species. Maybe fish in a, fish a bigger spot. A lot of times your bigger reefs will have more diversity. Maybe a, yeah. something to look at. Yeah, you can sense. diversify or a rig, you know? Yeah. Rigs can have a lot of diversity also. Bigger spots? Smaller, smaller hooks and smaller bait. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Skipper, yeah. that's a it's a good good report. You know what's next? We got to go offshore. Let's talk to Angelo D. Paola, the coastal connection down in Orange Beach, Alabama. Here's my pro tip of the day. Well, you know, nobody's been fishing. Basically, we gave that report. You had a day or two of calm weather. People caught more big tunas. You know, we we posted it on the Mobile Big Game Fishing Club page. Everybody was catching big tunas. So, you know, I I don't know what else to tell you. If it's calm, go find some friends that don't have kids because you're basically going to have to put together a trip. Like, hey, guys, it's calm. Who's in? Boom, you go. That's the only way to do it. Unless you're... Your friends that have kids have really cool wives, and they're like, "Sure, leave me at home with kids for three days." <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's tough. You got to be sitting on you got to be sitting on go this time of year because you you will get these little windows of calm weather, and you've just got to be able to capitalize on it. Uh, it's hard to plan a trip this time of year. It's almost impossible. I mean, if you plan one. You're, you're almost still just you're penciling it in and you're calling your crew. All right, guys, it looks like it's going to be good. Or, hey, guys, it ain't going to be good. We'll just, you know, let, let's plan two weeks from now or whatever. You know, that's just that's the only thing you got to figure out. And, you know, the other thing is, is the juice worth the squeeze? You know, if you're into catching 150, 200 pound tunas and you ain't ever caught one, right now is probably the juice is going to be worth the squeeze. You know, hey, honey. I appreciate it. I, we're going to wine and dine you for Valentine's Day. But uh, Friday, I'm going fishing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no doubt there's been some big fish going down over there. It's certainly the time of year that, that you can you could, I mean, count on finding uh, a larger grade of, of, of yellowfin tuna over off the lumps off Louisiana. I can't tell you how many people came up to me at the boat show and said – do you think Angelo was telling the truth about that putting that styrofoam in the chunk? 
I heard them talking about it too. They were questioning. <laughs> and I said, one hundred percent true. Well, I you- used to keep all this stuff super top secret. I didn't even like. I didn't even like fishing with outside of the normal crew because I didn't like telling anybody this. But truth is, I don't. I don't think it matters that much anymore. Uh, I don't get to fish as much anymore since I have two kids. And so, like, at least I can vicariously live through through you guys and social media. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, there's enough fish out there for everybody, especially well, if we leave a few for tomorrow. And if there's one thing that's definitely true about the tuna fishing in particular, <laughs> it's that as soon as one tactic is picked up, it, be- it becomes less effective. I mean, we've seen that over the years as more and more people fish. You know, at one point, chunking was the thing to do. And now, it, now it's just a, it's just part of the arsenal. And then it was kite fishing, and, and now it's again, it's just part of the ars- arsenal. So you really got to go out there and be prepared to do a lot of different things. I mean, if they're chewing, it doesn't matter what you do. But if they're not, you do have to be able to to mix it up and try some different things. And a lot of times, that's how it happens. You you get one fish off the chunk and. One fish off the kite, one fish off of a popper that you throw to a tuna that's, that's busting on a flying fish or something like that. Uh, catch one trolling, maybe one on a jig early in the morning. But you, but you you look up at the end of the trip and man, hey, we've got a we got a nice box of fish. But great box of fish, great memories. But it's those little things applying those right little pieces at the right situations. Well, tell me some more. Some, tell me some more secrets, then, man. What what other little things right. when it comes to chunking? Here's one of the things I picked up in Canada fishing for blue fans, and I thought it was a great idea, and I never thought of it before. So I didn't come up with these guys did. But one of the things they would do on the way out, when the tuna bite's tough, at least I do, I'll, I'll fish a really long fluorocarbon leader, and I tend just to reel it right onto my reel. Well, what happens with that is, is you get memory in your line. And so when you're chunking, your bait has this coil of line. It's not really flowing naturally so what they would do to counteract that is is they they take that rod and reel and they put it in the back gunnel rod holder and they'd run it all the way to a forward cleat and they had a little uh, you know thing of you know 200 pound test crimped on their little loop and then they would crank that rod down real tight so that line would be real taut on the way out what that would do is when we got to where we were fishing when you started chunking, because we did a lot of chunking up there, is the line had no memory, so the bait really uh, just flowed with the current real nicely. And up there, they also, you know, we were using styrofoam pieces of coffee cup down here, but they were, were fishing whole herring up there, and they were sticking uh, styrofoam peanuts in their mouth to do huh. the same thing to counteract the weight of the hook. I wonder, so, you know, I wonder, Angelo, you talk about that styrofoam deal, and I wonder if there's not an application where you couldn't just maybe put even like a a, a cork and maybe like uh, one of the things I've done in the surf is I've taken a little crappie cork and I'll put it on a kale hook and put a little hot glue on there. And it kind of helps that helps that hook float with the bait on it. And I wonder if you couldn't take a small piece of cork and just go ahead and hot glue it onto those hooks and maybe... Maybe that would keep from having to redo that that styrofoam cup every single time that you put that. Well, you're just cutting off a little piece in there. And and like I just cut it at a triangle and just sharp. The problem is to me with a piece of cork glued to your circle hook is uh, how's that affect the hook hook up? Right. You know what I mean? Closing down that gap. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. All right. the, The other thing I would say is this before we go. And I've always liked to snail my circle hooks. Mm-hmm. And, and I always felt like the hookup ratio is better. And you want that circle hook snailed back where the hook's bending back towards the line. But when you're having to fish 60 and 80 pounds lower carbon on a big, on a very big fish, the problem is the eye of the hook, where the line's going through the eye, chase through the hook. So I like on a chunk, chunk situation or any situation where I'm having to fish lighter lower carbon. I like to tie just a reg, you know, Palomar knot, blood knot, whatever you feel, you know, fisherman's knot, whatever somebody likes to make that hook to line connection. Just I'd say that a, that's a good tip. We call that a trust course. knot, whatever, whatever knot you trust yeah. to not break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Angela, I was going to, I was going to, um, 
talk a little bit more about that fluorocarbon stretching. I use a lot of fluorocarbon leader, whether it be on slip corks or just, you know, braid to fluorocarbon to a lure or whatever. But I always stretch that line out and pull it tight to make to to take that memory out. So that was a I thought that was a great tip. I mean, it's something that you can apply to just about any kind of fishing situation you're in. But especially something where you're free lining a bait, like if you were going to free line a trump or a croaker, I would think that that'd be very applicable in that situation. Very applicable. Well, Angelo, thanks for the report again this week, man. I know we're all looking forward to some some warmer weather and uh, getting back into the hard of fishing season. We'll be looking forward to getting more reports from you as we as we go a little further along. Uh, be safe and uh, be nice to your wife to, on Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> y'all do the same. We'll catch y'all later. All right, thanks, Angelo. All right, you're welcome. Bye bye. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by MDH Foundation Repair. If your home was experiencing foundation problems, MDH Foundation Repair has the best solutions to fix it right and fix it now and protect your most important asset, your home. Check them out at mdhfoundationrepair.com. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. Also brought to you by Geico. Call Ron Davis, Geico agent at 251-445-0053 or visit him online at geico.com slash mobile dash AL. And also brought to you by Day Cool Heating and Air, your home performance specialist. Contact them at 251-260-3858 or check them out online at www.daycoolair.com. License number AL07028. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Fish Bites. Check out their full line of freshwater, saltwater, tackle, and apparel at fishbites.com. This week's Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Angelo DiPaola. The coastal connection with EXP Realty, your boating and beach property specialist. Check me out on Facebook at Angelo DiPaola Realtor, the coastal connection, or call me direct at 850-287-3440.